Welcome everyone to the final webinar in the CAMEX webinar series on the topic of advanced manufacturing, the digital thread, and the composites factory of the future. And thank you all for joining. I would like to make you all aware that this session is being recorded and will be posted on the CAMEX website for on-demand viewing. If you have questions during the um, presentation, please enter them in the Q&A feature uh, in Zoom. Uh, that you can find on your control panel and then we will address those questions uh, after Don has finished his presentation. My name is Bob Yancey. I am the Director of Business Development for Hexel. Uh, I've been involved in the composites industry since uh, the 1980s and have been heavily involved with SAMPI for the last 10 years and filled a variety of roles for SAMPI and happy to uh, moderate this session today. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce Chris Locke, who's the Director of Marketing at CAMEX, and she'll make a few uh, brief announcements. Chris? Thanks, Bob. Hello, everyone. As Bob said, I'm Chris Locke, Director of Marketing, Membership, and Education at the Society for the Advancement of Material and Process Engineering. Thank you for taking the time to be here today to learn more about the Composites Factory of the Future by Dr. Don Kennard. I'm sure you've heard the news by now that CAMEX, the Composites and Advanced Material Expo, has gone virtual. CAMEX is the only Composites and Advanced Materials event happening this year, so we hope you'll join us to get business done and discover the latest in the industry. As of today, you'll have the opportunity to visit 100 exhibiting companies with more coming in each day. We also have over 100 educational sessions, three keynote speakers, six panelists, and live demos, interactive displays, and some pretty cool virtual networking platforms. Speaking of networking, CAMEX will, be, will offer real-time networking and community building live chat rooms that provide a space where attendees can learn and grow together with topics ranging from supply chain issues to workforce development, along with some fun topics like favorite quarantine recipes. But first, we have more educational opportunities for you leading up to CAMEX. Virtual tutorials take place before CAMEX on September 8th through the 10th, and two are included with the each premium registration package. They can also be purchased a la carte for live or in-demand viewing. We have six to select from, with titles ranging from making a composite part from concept to reality to non-destructive non-destructive inspection and evaluation for composites and bonded structures. For more information on these tutorials, click on the Educate tab at thecamex.org. The general session and keynote will feature Isabel Gradert, the material fast track leader at Airbus and general advisor for materials technology to the CTO as this year's general session speaker. Greater will share insights on Airbus's sustainability plan to be the world's first aircraft manufacturer to market a zero emission aircraft by 2035, and will explore how they will get there and the role materials and composite technologies will play. To kick off the week, CAMEX has the honor of presenting the 13th Administrator of NASA, Jim Bridenstine, for a lively discussion. NASA has helped move the industry forward in these trying times through investments in R&D and technology. Bridenstine will highlight, and develop, will highlight the developments between technology developments in advanced materials and U.S. competitiveness in manufacturing across a range of business sectors. He will wrap up this talk with an interview with NASA's partnership opportunities for businesses of all sizes. Finally, we will kick off Good Day CAMEX with a talk from Joel Whitehouse, Corporate Development Director for Hill and Smith Holdings. Whitehouse's talk will focus on the global outlook in M&A and will view the future of various business sectors across the globe. The presentation is business focused and will, for example, include ideas for the infrastructure and, and construction market segment. Stay tuned for more CAMEX updates by signing up for the CAMEX Connection newsletter, following us on social media, or by checking out our website at thecamex.org. Bob, back to you. Great. Thank you, Chris. Uh, great lineup uh, for CAMEX in a few weeks, and so I encourage all of you to block out your calendars and attend the sessions and uh, attend the virtual trade show and look forward to a good virtual event uh, in a few weeks. 
So I'm pleased to uh, introduce uh, Don Kennard. He is a senior fellow for aeronautics production operations at Lockheed Martin. Dr. Kennard is a, um, has been with Lockheed Martin for 35 years. He currently supports digital transformation at aeronautics, as well as program support such as the F-35. Prior to his current assignment, he was lead for the F-35 fighter production system, uh, rate transition, uh, and earlier director of F-35 production engineering responsible for joint strike fighter tooling, planning, manufacturing engineering, and aircraft systems testing. Before joining the F-35 program in 2004, Dr. Kennard held various positions in both engineering and manufacturing during his 18 years on the F-22. Again, a reminder, if you have questions uh, throughout Don's presentation, just enter them in the Q&A panel, and we'll get to those at the end of Don's presentation. Uh, he's agreed to do a little bit of history of composites uh, since uh, he's been involved in the industry since the 80s, and, uh, and then we'll get into kind of what's new in regards to the composites factory of the future. Don? Thank you, Bob. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone. Uh, Again, what I'm going to talk about and focus on is advanced manufacturing digital thread in industry. But as I go through here, I would like to also identify those composite related issues and give a little bit of history. I've been in the business a really long time and, and involved with and around composites uh, all uh, th really throughout all of this activity. Uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit of overview for Lockheed Martin. I'm going to talk about the digital thread, how we started, automation, uh, how we use it in the factory, and then the con connections. And then finally, talk about the way we're handling uh, Industry 4.0, or really the fourth industrial revolution, the revolution of data. Lockheed Martin, the biggest defense company in, in the world, uh, we make at Aeronautics, the division I work at, we make tactical fighters, lift, and it, of course, ADP, Skunk Works, uh, is part of our uh, operations. Uh, we have Missile and Fire Control Division there, hey, which hey, does Don, missiles. Done real quick. We're not seeing your slides. Oh, okay. Hold on. I thought it was shared. Let me just share again. There we go. Is that good? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. So I'm gonna talk about uh, four, I already talked about aeronautics, and missile and fire control, rotary and mission systems, which includes Sikorsky helicopters, and of course, space company or space systems, which is uh, satellite surveillance, human space flight, the Orion program, that type of thing. So again, pretty broad based organization. Production lines for aeronautics, we're doing the F-35 right now in Fort Worth, Texas, that's where I, uh, hang out. Well, actually, I'm hanging out at home these days, even though we're building the airplanes. Uh, about 80,000 Lockheed people are virtually att going to work these days. So that's actually worked really well for us. Uh, but we're currently producing about 11 month rate. We've made over 500 deliveries and the line is just chugging along uh, really well. C-130s in Marietta, Georgia, uh, roughly a two month rate. And we've made over 2,500 deliveries. And finally, uh, we've moved the F-16 line to Greenville, South Carolina. The line is restarted. Uh, we have lots of orders for F-16s, which is, you know, was a, maybe a surprise to a lot of people early on, but it's a great airplane. And uh, we're going to continue producing that for probably the next 10 years. So that's pretty exciting. In addition to obviously supporting, building and supporting the F-35, we also sustain the F-22, F-16, C-130s, C-5s. P3, U2s, some of these airplanes, you know, the C-130s are, are more than 60 years old, U2s are 60 plus years old, so there's all sorts of products up there, and uh, so there's a lot of uh, activity going on. Well, I'm going to talk about, from the beginning, and before I talk about digital thread, I'm going to talk about a little bit about my composites beginning, because kind of an interesting story. Um, uh, when I was in grad school at Texas A&M University in the 70s, this was the late 70s, uh, I was in a, a PhD program there in polymer science and engineering. And the, the Air Force was sponsoring a composite uh, design program there in the engineering department, composite materials, composite design, disc elasticity, composite mechanics. 
And uh, because I was a hardworking graduate student and wanted to, get, wanted to make sure and get a job after I graduated, I uh, took the classes that were in the engineering department for the master's degree. Now this program was sponsored by the Air Force and the Air Force was interested in us and the industry being able to uh, produce uh, uh, composite structures and to be able to improve the, the utilization of composites in, in fighter structures and helicopters. So we had engineers from Bell Helicopter and engineers from General Dynamics, which was previously where Lockheed Martin was in Fort Worth and all over the industry. And so I was in classes with all these engineers now. I think the only difference was they were getting their regular pay for being uh, there at the university and I was a, a graduate assistant at the same time. So, uh, but it was really interesting uh, working with those folks and taking the classes, uh, not really thinking about much at, the po at that point. Then I went to work for a uh, uh, oil company for a few years, then came back to Lockheed Martin in the uh, 1984. Uh, and one of my first jobs was, uh, we started getting involved with F-22 materials. Uh, this I call the golden age of materials. If you're an m and engineer in the 80s, uh, then there was so much cool stuff going on. We were looking at advanced metallics, uh, advanced aluminums, aluminum lithiums, uh, forgings, casting metallics. We were looking at, at dry thermoplastics like peak. Uh, uh, we were looking at uh, wet thermoplastics uh, like K3. We were looking at uh, epoxies and BMIs and all sorts of materials. And so the, the world was, was pretty wide open. We had dozens, literally, of composite material producers. And uh, so when I got there, you know, my job was trying to help sort through uh, all of the materials and try to decide what were the best things at the time that were mature and cost effective to uh, build the F-22 program. Well, I learned a couple of things. I came out of grad school, I guess, thinking like everybody else, the composites were going to take over the world. The composites were, they were always going to save weight and they were always value cost effective. And uh, I think my F-22 experience clearly indicated that a couple of things. One, that composites didn't always save weight. They're, they're, they're fantastic in XY loading. They're not terribly good in Z loading, bending. And that's a big problem because bulkheads, you know, metallics are isotropic in all directions is very, very good for you know things like uh, bending flange bending and things and so we made a lot of uh, composite parts on f-22 uh, early on on the prototypes but it, over time kind of changed them back to metallic in a lot of cases we tried composite bulkheads and frames and all kinds of things and i think again we decided that composites have their place metallics have their place and uh, overall, you've got to pick the right material for the application. And you've got to do the science, you know, do the work. Uh, I was also at the time the uh, program manager for exploratory development of thermoplastic composites, where we were looking at IM6 peak. One of my, one of my uh, I think, uh, disappointments was that we had actually uh, built, designed, and flew a big thermoplastic door on the F-22. The problem was later on the material uh, became unavailable and we had to change back to, uh, to BMI. So it's kind of one of those things. But, but again, I think I saw the fact that there was uh, gonna be a composite future that we were gonna have to look at those materials across the board. Uh, so let me get back into the digital thread now. The digital thread uh, started in really some combination of AFRL along with uh, uh, Lockheed Martin came up with the term digital thread, and it really implies the, the creation of these 3D solid models in engineering and then the consumption of these 3D solid models, not only in tooling, but in electronic mockups and uh, digital process verification, maintenance, uh, simulations, factory simulations. We directly program to those uh, uh, NC, uh, to those models for NC programming. Uh, lean assembly planning, uh, using uh, metrology solutions like laser trackers, automated drilling, and finally those models make their way into the uh, maintenance and tech orders activity. So again, there's, there's a digital thread here, and if you go a little bit further, you see that these digital threads uh, really end up creating what we call digital twins, which are uh, functional twins of aircraft performance, which include structural performance, 
um, you know, uh, mission system performance, vehicle system performance. So digital twins beget, or digital threads be, beget digital twins. And now we use the digital twins that we've created through all the validation to be able to redesign the airplane, to add capabilities, uh, to do modifications and all, all that's kind of the, the whole purpose of this is to tie that all back together again. So again, solid models were just the beginning and the solid models and the way we designed those led to a lot of applications. Uh, let's start, let's talk about a couple of them. First of all, uh, obviously fiber placement is a big activity. Um, one of the other things we learned was that fiber placement makes a lot of sense for parts that are extremely large. Uh, if a part is small enough to use broad goods tape, for example, we, when broad goods tape became available from the composites industry, uh, for the most part, anything you could hand lay and cut and lay up uh, with uh, broad goods tape, which is like 60 inch tape, uh, we pretty much use that for a lot of, but things like uh, this inlet duct that we're making here, things like the big wing skins, things like nacelle skins, those tend to be fiber placed. And there's a lot of, a lot of issues about, you know, put down, fiber placement has its, has its utility, uh, especially the, but the issues are, one is fairly expensive capital equipment and, and, and today is still fairly slow with pounds per hour laydown rates in terms of materials uh, uh, utilization. So again, we lay by hand where we can and use fiber placement where we need to. Uh, one of the things that was developed back in the day was the ultrasonic, laser ultrasonics. Uh, we, we developed that at Lockheed Martin. It's used to inspect composite parts. Instead of using uh, LK ultrasonic squirters, uh, we use laser ultrasonics, which basically use lasers to create this thermoplastic wave in the part. And we measure that physical wave with another laser. And it's really a lot faster. And again, I don't have to have a lot of tooling to locate the parts. Uh, we also use the digital thread for things like auto drilling. So we drill an awful lot of holes on the F-35 using uh, automated drilling. And finally, robotic coding. So the digital thread uh, is designed to support automation. And uh, I, actually, I will mention one of my favorite technologies. The first real, I want to call digital thread technology was uh, these Vertec lasers used for fiber placement in the composites business. Those have been used, gosh, 25 years or more now. Used them on the F-22, used them on the F-35. And the technology, I, when I started there, frankly, we, we had these uh, 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 plastic templates we used to use to do layups. And you put the template on the on the part, and you'd mark where the ply goes, and then you'd lay the ply down. And that all went away. Boy, was that a pain! And and using Vertec, these laser systems to uh, improve so much. One, we could actually tell. Uh, it showed us where the plies went on the part, and secondly, it helped us verify that we we're putting the right ply down in the right place. So really interesting. Uh, any case, so automation was phase one, uh, excuse me, digital thread was phase one, phase two was all of these automations. Phase three is we're trying to take the 3D data to the mechanics on the floor. For example, this is one example. Uh, so there's a big composite skin and I'm actually projecting information on these holes. Is this fastener? So I'm literally uh, just like a movie theater, I'm projecting work instructions up onto the surface of the part. And uh, this can be used for all sorts of things, you know, one in detailed fabrication, uh, assembly, fasteners, all kinds of applications for this. Now, this is a, an option for this is obviously uh, augmented reality. I'm I'm, I'll show you that in just a minute. But this is one way of doing it. And this is directly taking the, the digital data from the engineering models and taking them to the street, so to speak. Added to manufacturing is another example. Uh, you know, it's funny, uh, composites have always been, in my mind, kind of an additive manufacturing, never really considered as additive manufacturing, even though I, I certainly classify it like that. Uh, but the fact is we use additive manufacturing all over uh, on the left-hand side there. Uh, composite or these plastic tools using uh, fusion deposition modeling. We have, we probably have a dozen of those machines in house that we use to make plastic tools. We've made thousands and thousands of, of everything from uh, 
you know, locators to uh, uh, tools for modifications in the field to uh, um, uh, masking agents for coatings. There's all sorts of things. And of course, Lockheed Martin has been working on uh, additive, metal additive, for more than 20 years. We started out with powder processing, laser powder processing, and kind of moved up to what you see here, which is a Siaki process for for uh, using uh, electron beam welding to weld titanium together. Um, and of course, uh, back in the old, back in the day, I I was using. Um, uh, thermoplastics, uh, was using hot head tape laying of thermoplastics as really an additive manufacturing. And again, I think you have to look at composites, uh, uh, especially fiber placement as an additive type of technique uh, for composites. And now the thermoplastic technologies I've seen, which are kind of interesting, uh, being able to uh, consolidate and lay down at the same time. Uh, I was trying to do that 25 years ago. Unfortunately, the technology wasn't quite available to do that. Uh, but then we were doing things like uh, taking these blanks and putting them in a press. So there's, there's a lot of applications out there for composites, I think, uh, uh, in, in that world. Augmented reality, um, I, you know, everybody's looking at this. Uh, I, I believe that there's a place for augmented reality. We're using it right now to do training for wire harness installations in the factory. We're using it to put on, for example, at Space Company, uh, they're, they're using it to show where different nut plates go on composite skins. Um, this particular application, this mechanic is using it to wire a harness. So there are applications uh, really good, both training. Uh, in the field, there's also applications where we're doing maintenance on the jet. So uh, this is an area that is coming to uh, fruition, I think, and will over time. It's not, it's not going to be 100%. Not everybody's going to be wearing these things, but, and I tend to prefer tablets to wearing the glasses, uh, but that's just me. I mean, uh, I think uh, other people will do different things. We're also using it to help us wire the airplanes uh, on the floor, so another good application for that. One of the newer applications, and it's not a technology thing, but let's say I have an airplane somewhere in the world or a manufacturing facility someplace in the world and I need to connect there. Well, a couple of ways of doing that. Right now, a lot of times I will have to send somebody on an airplane to go service that account or that problem. And in the future, I believe we'll be connecting virtually using, um, you know, pretty much what we're doing here, virtual connections, uh, showing where the problems are, getting, you know, one-on-one -on -one with the technicians. Uh, the issue today is one of, uh, of security. How do I how do I guarantee that my that I'm secure from one place to the other? And remember that a lot of our planes are on active bases, and there's a lot of security offset security for those bases. So this is something that we'll learn over time. Obviously, a lot of our technology is moving into the cloud, and I think we are very focused on. Um, uh, being able to apply this and, and much more than we do today. Phase four, now this was one that came on later. This, this whole technology using laser scanning and uh, 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 laser scanning and structured light scanning. And what we're doing here is we're taking 3D pictures of the structure and we're comparing those 3D pictures to the uh, to the actual as designed uh, model. So again, we're doing as designed to as built comparison, looking for uh, looking for problems, looking for deviations. I mean, you can use it for for product acceptance for metal parts. Uh, you see up in the right hand corner, we're using it to measure a composite uh, assembly. Uh, we're looking at verifying openings in the airplane. Uh, we use it for perhaps coating thickness measurements, very, very accurate systems. Um, and we're using it for a lot of things that, for example, I've got to measure a lot of fasteners for flushness and a lot of seams and gaps. There's thousands and thousands of those measurements on the floor right now. And we're moving to where I'm going to be able to scan those and get them in. And so, you know, uh, inspection of parts and composite parts and everything else. Now, Composite parts are a little bit interesting here because uh, one of the continuing issues with composites is a phenomenon called spring-in. So when I have a complex contoured part, 
it always springs in. It always springs. There's always a little bit different. Now, I can account for that on simple angles, but on complex contoured parts, uh, that's kind of a guessing game in terms of how well you can predict that, that spring in and that final form. Uh, again, if you have it uh, being you know, installed on substructure, eh, you can pr pretty much take it to the substructure. But when you have something where the part is essentially unconstrained, then you've got to account for that, uh, for that spring in on the composite parts. That's something that's, that's still one of those things that uh, uh, is, you know, that we still have issues with now and then. But again, the virtual validation, the connecting the as design to the as built is really changing and going to change a lot of things in the business. Uh, if, if I'd have had this early on an F35, I could have identified problems very much earlier. So again, eventually this will be used for part acceptance. Eventually this will be used uh, for first article assembly, first article inspections everywhere. Let me give you a couple of examples of, of that technology. This is a, a, a technology we developed on for F35 because we were trying to control the thickness of the parts, of the composite parts. So uh, we would design the part to be at or below nominal thickness. We would lay it up, cure it, and then measure the thickness using a laser scanning system. This laser scanning system then uh, would identify where I could add uh, glass plies to be able to bring the composite part back up to a nominal thickness. Uh, it would uh, uh, calculate where those, what those plies needed to be. It would give me a nesting pattern that I would use to, uh, to cut those plies out. And then I would use my Vertec laser projection system to project where I need to put those glass plies on the part. Then I'd have to recure that skin and I would control the thickness very, very tightly. Composite thickness control has always been an iffy, another one of those challenges in the industry because typically you have a plus or minus uh, maybe as much as 6% on the thickness variation. That's a lot more than we typically can tolerate. But this was a, a technology inv invented by Lockheed Martin to help do that uh, control uh, of, of our parts. Um, another, way, another way of doing that is with is with some of the new advanced machining technologies where I put sacrificial plies on in a, a high precision um, a machining equipment. That's another way of doing it. But again, that's highly capital intensive. This is uh, a, a quite a bit less capital intensive. Here's another application. This was, uh, we used to use this big old additive manufacturing tool to do clearance checks in our weapons bays and Today, what we do is we put a laser scanner in our weapons bay and we uh, measure the volume using the laser scanner, compare it to the model and buy off the clearances. Uh, this is a big deal because I tell you what, get, putting that in the weapons bay and then getting up there to look for all those clearances is very difficult. But again, the technology available today for as designed to as built uh, comparison is really fabulous. And that's something that's part and parcel of the factory of the future, for sure. Uh, I want to spend a little time now talking about uh, the next industrial revolution, and it's a revolution of data. And it's, it's data, it's technical data, because it's going to involve how we transfer data from engineering to manufacturing. You know, today, uh, in the composites world, we're fairly sophisticated in terms of fiber sim and all the tools we use to, to take engineering and to manufacturing. And, and I think we know a lot of the concerns about, you know, uh, obviously layup and, uh, you know, you don't want to be terribly complicated if you lay up on a fiber placement machine because the machine will just go back and forth laying little pieces and you don't really want that. So you've got, you've got to develop that compromise between engineering and manufacturing. But that connection with uh, composite parts is pretty, is pretty solid with some of the, the tools you use to, to do the layups in the factory. Um, some of the other data though is not so connected. And so this is a typical, um, aer well, in fact, this is pretty typical of almost all companies, aerospace or not. And, and what it is is, what it shows is I have, I have uh, engineering systems and this is things like the PLM system and manufacturing systems like the manufacturing execution systems or MES. I have ERP systems, I have sustainment systems. 
And for the most part, the data in those systems is, is siloed. And it takes mandrolic or people to move data back and forth between these systems typically. And it's not just data, but it's information because I've get information coming from one way, going another direction. Uh, and today these tend to be very siloed. This is, by the way, they call it Conway's law. Conway's law says that, that uh, your systems tend to mimic the bureaucracy of your organizations. And so engineering system uh, is really mimics the engineering bureaucracy, MES, et cetera. And so they all grow up in these silos um, that are, that are independent and they're all sub-optimized for their own usage. The world is changing though. This siloed data is, is, gonna, is gonna eventually disappear. We're getting much more integration. We're, we're trying to capture engineering to design, to test, to produce it, to sustain it, you know, as designed, as planned, as built, as maintained, configurations all held together uh, by the, the product structure or maybe the, the bill of material we call the golden thread because the bill of material is what, what is connecting all of these systems together. It's the E-bomb, M-bomb, the O-bomb, the as-built bomb, the S-bomb, sustainment bomb. All of those things are connecting the worlds together. And this trend is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and probably the last part here is about Industry 4.0. And, and again, as I mentioned earlier, Industry 4.0 is, is, is the fourth industrial revolution. You know, the first industrial revolution was the agrarian revolution. Everybody going from farming to more uh, automated things uh, with water power and steam power. Uh, the second industrial revolution was electrical power, drove all of the new factory expansions. Uh, so that's really the second industrial. The third industrial revolution was the computer revolution. Um, look how many things have changed. I mean, I hate to say it, but I was in the business before there were computers and, uh, or copy machines, by the way. Or, and in fact, even when I was in college, I used a slide rule that I could tell you how old I was, how old I, I feel sometimes. But the point, the point is, is, that, is that technology changes continuously. And technologies, all of those technologies at the time were incredibly disruptive to, uh, to, to the, I mean, think about all the people you had making horses and buggies that, that now had to make cars. Industries change, some don't survive. Uh, you know, we had industries, uh, think about it, uh, Kodak, Kodak decided they wanted to keep making film. You know, we're not interested in digital cameras. We make film, that's how we make money. Uh, Blockbuster, who had the option years ago to buy Netflix, decided, no, we're, we rent movies. That's what we want to do. And so the whole industry, again, is going to change here. And, and, and what we're trying to do is, one, connect, connect all of the systems together, uh, connect all of that data together, uh, make it more automated. Um, my boss really likes to... to, to evaluate production just from his phone. I mean, he would like to see factory progress and factory status on his phone. And for the most part, you can. We have systems that do that now. In fact, I can look and find out aircraft status in Japan and Italy and uh, Israel. Um, and so we have a good, and pretty soon, that'll be available too, obviously, for the sustainment activity. We want to be able to take all that data and do analytics. And finally, we want to connect all of our systems here, all of our factory systems, this operational technology, which is things like non-contact metrology and optical projection and NC programming and all of these devices that we use, we want to connect them all to the intranet and be, be able to do things. I'll give you one example. Uh, so as I'm drilling a hole, I want to measure that grip length. And I want to take that grip length and send that to uh, the, the warehouse to kit those fasteners for me. And then I want the fasteners delivered, cleaned and ready to go and promoted. And then I will use the optical projection systems to project what fastener goes in what hole. And so I have saved a ton of time by using, <clears throat> and I want to say that's real IOT. That's 
how I'm connecting the equipment to the internet. Now, you know, probably in 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 the in the uh, uh, infancy stage, I'm using it trying to do predictive maintenance. Uh, the real benefit is not the predictive maintenance, but things like the fastener selection, things like comparing as designed to as built fabrication, uh, connecting the systems together. <clears throat> so whether you're in the composites business or whether you're in the uh, assembly business, the fact is data is going to change and data is going to be manipulated a lot differently in the future. <clears throat> okay, so first let's talk about the future of the digital thread and then I'll talk about composites in more detail. First of all, we're going to continue to find applications for in product development, manufacturing, and sustainment for the digital thread. <coughs> you know, digital twins, automating analysis, cognitive assistance, robotics, uh, uh, simulations, augmented reality, those are things that are going to continue to be developed. We're going to apply that, that systems engineering philosophy to integrate those tools together, integrate our systems together, and then we're going to be able to use that analytics. So, um, now, what about what about composites? Uh, I, you know, I think there's a couple of things that are really clear. Composites <coughs> will tend to be a a power going forward. I don't see anything. I don't see anything coming on the horizon that's going to change uh, the way composites. You know, almost 50% of the commercial aircraft now are composite materials. Uh, you know, the fighter jets. We're still we're still in the you know, 30% range uh, composite material wise. <coughs> but, but again, commercial about 50%, I think we'll stay there. Uh, one of, again, and I mentioned this as one of my disappointments is there's so few producers anymore of fibers and resins. You know, the industry is, is, is really uh, hampered by the fact that that materials technologies are are typically very seen as very fairly high risk. It's expensive to develop materials, expensive to qualify materials. Uh, but it's one of those things that in the past we've had that government industry uh, collusion on these things that have helped expand. And I, I think that's something that happen again. Obviously the new technologies, uh, there's things out there like uh, um, you know, out of autoclave curing, uh, again, uh, uh, additive manufacturing for, you know, direct consolidation during, during manufacture for composites. Uh, I still think there's hope for bonded composites. I mean, you know, I've been working on bonded composites on and off for, for 30 years. And, uh, you know, it has that, that problem with being able to inspect the bond line. But I've seen a lot of technology out there for being able to use process control to be able to control the, the bond light and be able to do composite bonding. So I've seen some interesting products. Lockheed's been doing a lot. Uh, our Northrop Grumman folks and Boeing folks are doing a lot of stuff. So th there's some opportunities there. Again, the, the problem is you got to go in eyes wide open because you, you've got to be able to certify the structure and you got to be able to certify it. Um, you, you can't necessarily have what they call um, you know, failures proof materials, you, meaning the structure has got to be so that even if a bond line failures to survive, that's, that's difficult to do. Um, I see composites again, continuing to be a, a major presence in the aerospace business. And in fact, even, even maybe getting to the point of including functionality in composites together. So it can do more jobs than just, uh, you know, be a structural material. So, uh, I think the other thing is interesting is uh, our commercial air, commercial aviation is finding a lot of advantages to composites um, in the sustainment world, meaning that that because they don't fatigue, uh, because they're uh, generally tough materials, they don't corrode, they don't fatigue. And so there's a lot of advantages to composites that I don't think we really thought about. I think most people in my generation thought, well, it's always about weight. Well, it isn't just about weight anymore. It's about the the sustainment advantages for composite, uh, and the fact that, uh, interestingly enough, 
Um, composites rarely fail when we're do testing airplanes. You know, metal parts fail, and metal parts fatigue, and that's typically, you know, what fails. Composite parts typically don't fail, and now, now maybe that's a, a, a factor of the way they're designed, but the fact is, is uh, we have a lot more issues with metal than we do with composites. Uh, finally, I think I, I'll point out that uh, for people coming into the business today, uh, I, I want to stress that you need to make sure that, that you look to the, uh, how would I call it, that you learn the lessons of the past, that you go in and try to understand what has happened, where we've been as an industry, how we went through, you know, epoxy materials, BMIs, thermoplastics, uh, bonded composites, uh, fiber placement, uh, uh, do the science in terms of deciding what materials are right for each application. Because, you know, again, I don't believe that composites are going to take are going to be bulkheads in the future. I mean, that, that I find that a little bit hard to, 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 to deal with. That doesn't mean it won't happen. It just means that, that that's not something that I see as an is a, is a easy thing up front or right now. Uh, composites have their place, metallics have their place, uh, materials have their niche, and that's one of the things that I'll be doing. Um, with that, I think I'm done, and I'll turn it back over to Bob. Great, thank you, Don. Excellent presentation. Um, so before we get started on the Q&A, we've got a couple of poll questions. Um, and uh, so Brianna, if you can bring up the first poll question, we'll have the audience uh, respond to that and then Don can uh, comment on the results. So how do you think that composites manufacturing will be impacted by automation technologies in Industry 4.0? Significant impact over the next five years, incremental impact over the next 10 years, or minimal impact. So please put your uh, votes in and we'll pull up the results here in a minute. Okay, Brianna, you want to pull up the results? Okay, so pretty evenly mixed uh, on the first two responses. So there's no feeling except for it looks like one person says it'll have minimal impact. So, so Don, what's your view in terms of the impact it'll have over the next five to 10 years? I'm in the middle group. I'm in the incremental impact over the next 10 years because I think that, again, we have a lot of the automation technology in place with fiber placement, for example, and uh, you know it's pretty much uh, uh, used essentially all over the industry. I think there will be continued, uh, you know, where the development will be will be things like how do I improve laydown rates for composites? How do I get more material down faster? Uh, there, there might be some more uh, activity with uh, you know consolidation on the fly types of, of composites, but I, I think we'll see incremental impact. I don't think, I think it'll, it's all important because we're all looking for, for opportunities, but, but I don't see it sig as significant right now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and Don and I were on a previous panel and, and that topic came up and, and uh, um, yeah, I think the general conclusion of the panelists was that if you start out with the idea of making incremental impact, you'll have more success. If you're looking for some big, huge, significant impact, those, those projects can take a long time and sometimes they don't fulfill all your uh, objectives. And so it's good to plot out a course of making incremental improvements as you go along. Okay, Brianna, if you can bring up the second poll question. So what is the top trend you see for the future of composites manufacturing? Automation of current processes? digitization of current processes or new manufacturing processes? Okay, Brianna, you wanna bring up the results? Okay, so automation is the winner. Uh, Digitization is a close second, uh, but you know, also significant 19% showing uh, 
new manufacturing processes. So, so Don, again, your your kind of view on this? Well, I got to admit to being in the digitization view. I mean, I'm talking about composites from engineering development through manufacturing and into sustainment. Um, I think the composite modeling and simulation processes uh, will help us uh, design better. I see, you know, uh, tools that help us, uh, you know, calculate loads better, tools that help us calculate, uh, you know, how things go together on the manufacturing floor better. So I'm a digitization, manufacturing, modeling, and simulation believer. And I think that's probably the one to me uh, that's the, the highest one. Again, automation, uh, you know, let's, let me take one example, uh, hand layup. We talk about hand layup, and I know there's people working on it, but you know, it's hand layup is pretty straightforward. And yes, although it's very manual with broad goods tape, it's pretty effective. Uh, you know, people are working on how to do smaller parts or parts that can be done with broad goods tape in a more automated manner. But um, I haven't seen anything that makes me think that 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 part of the business is going to disappear anytime soon. Okay, thank you. Okay, so those are all poll questions. So we've got a number of questions coming in from the audience and feel free to uh, continue to um, post questions in the Q&A, uh, but we'll start to go through those. Uh, so first of all, the first question, Don, is, is um, somewhat related to what you just talked about, the role of modeling and simulation. So the question is, is that you talked about um, comparing the as-built manufactured product to the as designed product and how you're using inspection technology to be able to look at that. What role does manufacturing simulation play in that whole process of trying to get closer to the as designed product in your manufacturing? Well, I'm going to say it like this. Uh, I mean, the goal in, in one of the goals in digital transformation is to reduce the uh, the cost and span for product development and one of the best ways to do that is to make the engineering product the product that comes out of engineering initially to be much more mature than it typically is uh, you know when you start a big program uh, like an f-35 program you know everything is new everything is brand new everything is is first time trial and because of that, there's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of risk. And that's why we have these big learning curves for military programs in particular and commercial programs. The better, however, that we do manufacturing simulations, the better that we are able to uh, predict how parts go, go together, the be better we're able to predict uh, interferences because of uh, tolerancing issues, the better we're able to uh, look at sequencing and know when I can put parts in and what part go in what sequence and whether they, how they fit. Uh, it, all of those things will help us to figure out how to, how to have more certainty in our manufacturing plan, which will give us a more mature product, which will reduce our span time and learning curves for making the product. So I think, I think the, and I'm going to call it the virtualization of development, meaning that Today, we're still a build, test, build, test, build, test type of thing. And I don't think that's the way we're going to build the Starship Enterprise in the future. I think that for the most part, if you've seen the, if you're a nerd like me, you've seen the Star Trek uh, Next Generation, and they pull up a, a working simulation of the uh, uh, warp drive engine, and they do some testing to simulate changes to it. They validate the changes, and they implement it directly there those virtualizations uh, and they're they're for example uh, uh, instead of having to do a lot of wind tunnel testing you might do more cfd testing using high performance computing uh, loads development uh, you know all of the analysis types of things being more integrated into the engineering is is really where I see the modeling and simulation going. And then by the way, let's make sure we understand sustainment simulation is the same opportunity to, to be able to simulate. On F-35, one example, F-35 had a, a facility called what we called SAIL. And I can't remember what it stands for now, but it's basically where you put on this helmet and you walk into a virtual life-size representation 
of the F-35. And in you put on the gloves, and so you could try to do various maintenance activities. And that was pretty, that was, it was pretty cool to, to play in there. The thing I remember most is once I took the helmet off, uh, literally having to hold on to the wall to get back to my desk because I was so, it so disoriented me. Uh, but the fact is that virtualization, you know, VR, virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, actual simulations, uh, um, you know, uh, I mean, we're literally lowering the learning curve by the kind of simulations that we do these days and all that's just good stuff. Okay. Yeah. And to follow on with that, you'd mentioned that the typical process of design, build, test, design, build, test, is that happening in the virtual world where you design, uh, virtually build it and virtually test it so that you can really be more efficient and explore the space, um, um, you know, in a broader way than we could do physically? Exactly. And, and uh, part of the, part of the issue is, is that in, in the older days, it would take us a long time to look at, oh, okay, so I want, I want to move the vertical tail back five inches, or I want to big, have a bigger wing, or I want to move frame spacing. And doing that analysis took months. That's being more virtualized. The ability to get good data virtually, let me, another example might be uh, 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 fuel systems. Uh, I would, instead of having to build a big laboratory, a physical, what we call iron bird laboratory, for fuel systems, maybe I, it's all virtual. And so the technology to be able to do these simulations is, is expanding. And this is also one of the areas where uh, we, I see good opportunities for government industry and academia to participate in these types of, of virtualizations. Because, and again, I'm not saying that's, that, we're, that we're far along that road, but I'm saying that that's where we're headed. And, Virtualizations give you the opportunity to look at many more configurations and, and really help to optimize. I don't know that it'll, I, I'd like to think it'll decrease the design time, but in the meantime, I also think that it can serve to get a more, a better product faster, which is kind of what we're looking for. Yeah, okay. Uh, so the next question coming in from the audience is that, um, uh, you know, you talked about comparing the uh, as manufactured product to the as designed product. Uh, is there activity in regards to in process inspection? So while you're, while you're building up the structure, especially with composites, uh, are you able to inspect and highlight, you know, areas where it might be going out of tolerance or other issues that you can address before it gets to a, a tolerance deviation that's unacceptable? I, I, I think that's exactly the future. I mean, today, today we're using it for, well, we were using it for just troubleshooting on the floor when we had a problem. Today, we're looking at it for things like I mentioned, blah, blah, bombs, to do actual inspections on the floor. Tomorrow, we'll be using it next for first article inspections, for first article manufacturing. And then eventually, we'll be using it for real-time inspections on the floor. I mean, what's great about it, and uh, if you've ever put airplanes together, one of the things that's, that's frustrating is uh, I have a, a, a tube that doesn't fit, let's say. Well, I don't know whether it's a tube problem or the bracket problem or a structure problem. Today, that was yesterday. Today, I can know pretty quickly which of those is wrong by taking a 3D image of that pic of that tube or that bracket. I know whether it's mislocated. I know whether it's a tube or a bracket or a structure problem. Uh, those are things that used to take weeks to resolve in the, in the, in the day. Now they became, can be done pretty quickly. Now, if I'm, I have, you know, for example, thousands of brackets on an airplane. If I can now monitor the locations of those as I build them, uh, then all of a sudden we're there. And I think eventually the technology will get ex inexpensive enough to be able to use for routine. It will be used certainly for first article kinds of things on every new program. I, I can't see that why you wouldn't do that. <clears throat> but I think that, and by the way, I'm talking about part inspection, tool inspections, and uh, um, uh, assembly inspections. Uh, that way you can tell whether tooling plant, tooling and manufacturing, everything is where it's supposed to be early in the program. Uh, 
Uh, that is going to be a fantastic. And then finally, of course, I mentioned the use for doing inspections like fastener flushness and you know gaps and mismatches and those types of things on composites. Composites are, um, you know, it's, it's since most of the airplane exterior is composite. I mean, we use it a lot on those types of things, coating inspections, and, and again, it's uh, uh, the world is is changing. Uh, it's it's going to be a lot. It's going to be a lot cleaner going forward, being able to find problems. Okay, thank you. Uh, so next question is Lockheed Martin's obviously a large company with a lot of resources, a lot of assets uh, to be able to um, implement these industry 4.0 technologies and factory the future. Any words of advice to a small composite manufacturing company in terms of how they can improve their processes with much limited resources? Well, uh, you know, you, you, you think, you know, we are a large company and we do have a lot of resources, but you cannot imagine, uh, you know, we're a, thousands of engineers and we have a, thousands of engineers that all want to spend our money differently. Okay, so, so we fight tooth and nail every year to get the right things funded. So this is obviously a struggle. Uh, but on small companies, I think the, I think the thing is, is you've got to open up your silos for data. Uh, you know, I, I, I need to know where, when my stuff is going to, for instance, I need to know when my parts are going to arrive without having to chase down the guy with the Excel spreadsheet he filled out manually because he's talked to the supplier. You know, I need to depend and focus on our systems to give, to have that data available. And I need to try as much as possible to automate that data stream to get dashboards for things to, to not have to not have to make ma manual charts and graphs and to be able to automate those things uh, whether you're a small company or a big company and some of that stuff is fairly inexpensive it's just you got to have the idea or you got to have the concept of how do I want to manage my data and how do I want to use my people and it's probably not for chart making yeah. Yeah. And I've been involved with a lot of small uh, companies as well. And I do see that, you know, those that are committed to process improvement, um, you know, can find bottlenecks in their current process, things that don't flow as efficiently as they need to. And sometimes it's a simple macro in Excel. Sometimes it's, um, you know, buying an inexpensive digital camera to be able to track some things um, and so forth. So there are, pro there are, um, t there is technology available for uh, making improvements, even with, even with limited budgets. You know, one thing that I'll point out is, uh, <clears throat> you know, we've been moving a lot to the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning for a lot of our data. And one of the things that's been hard to get sometimes is these data engineers, data scientists. And so we've created, for example, our own training approach because we're trying to raise a generation of citizen data scientists, I'll call them, that will be able to understand the systems and be able to, uh, you know, uh, how would I call it, uh, master the data that's already out there for, for, for good, for, for good purposes. So that's something that's uh, coming along. And I think every company uh, at some point, these, these data analysts and those folks are, Again, you have to understand the process. You can't just be a data person because if you don't know how the process works, the data won't help you. If you know how the process works, the data, the citizen data scientist who's an expert in the process can really do some good things. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is that, uh, can you comment on the mix? Uh, in Lockheed Martin, obviously software is a big part of, of um, Factory the Future. Um, what kind of mix is there in Lockheed Martin in regards in regards to using commercial software products versus in-house development? <laughs> you know, it's funny, it's a funny discussion because frankly, the, uh, um, uh, you know, what do you call it? Free and uh, FOSS software, free and open source software is a big deal for us. There's people creating software out there. And of course we have to be very careful what we incorporate into our products. Uh, but, but I wanna say that there's a lot of software that's commercial that we use. Um, and then a lot of it is the functional software for how you run an airplane, for example, that's all internal and, and self-created. 
so it's a mixture you know we use uh, you know standard operating software standard things but then of course when you get down to the specifics of how things work that's very specialized software data fusion all of those kind of things make it you know very very uh, internally related and by the way uh, the world of software is getting highly automated too. I mean, we're now running software on a workstation instead of like going to the software labs, software labs, labs to airplane. We're now still going lab, you know, software in a workstation and into the airplane. And so there, we're being able to do a lot of virtual development for software. It's called software factory development, but it's another aspect of the business. Okay. Uh, next question is in regards to, um, you know, in, in developing the strategy for uh, digitization and uh, factory of the future for Lockheed Martin, do you, do you survey other industries and look at best practices from like the automotive or the energy sector? Uh, uh, and are they look and, and vice versa? Or do they interact with you to find out what Lockheed Martin is doing? Uh, absolutely, we've we've had uh, several of these what we call non-competitive coordinations. You know, where you have companies that are in different industries that get together and have discussions about technology. We do that kind of thing. Obviously, we follow. Uh, one of the interesting things in the aerospace business, I guess, is if you think about it, we partner with everybody. You know, we're partnered with Boeing on F-22, with Northrop Grumman and uh, BAE and Pratt and Whitney on F-35. So this whole industry partners up all the time. And so there's a lot of information that goes back and forth during those things. Uh, plus we spend a lot of time. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at a lot these days is, you know, you look at the Apples and the Amazons and all of those kind of things. And we, we try to benchmark those kind of companies to find out how well they're using data. I mean, it's just, I mean, those of you who order off of Amazon Prime, it's just absolutely unbelievable how organized that is. And I mean, I ordered a part for my pool last week and it came the next day and I'm like, oh my God, you know, that's, some, that's something I would like, that we would like to learn because we are not that good. Uh, Amazon is really good. And now they're going to start dropping packages in my backyard. So um, I hear they got approval to start doing that. So I, I guess they'll be, we'll have to worry about the porch thieves anymore, porch pirates. They'll be, they'll be dropping them off in the backyard where your dog can tear them up. So uh, I guess that's the next generation of things. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question is that, you know, when you look out, so we, we you know, we had a poll question in regards to, um, uh, what it's going to look like over five to 10 years. And uh, uh, your, your thought was that incremental improvement um, um, and that we'll continually make progress. What do you see as the biggest challenges uh, to a company uh, to be able to, you know, achieve the types of return on investment that, that uh, they want to make with these investments and implementation? See, that's where it's really difficult. You know, military business, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, you know, a regular business, a regular company, when I worked for an oil company, we did discounted cash flow. So we invested so we can make more money. I mean, you, you spent the capital money and you had to have a certain discounted cash flow, which is at least three times what the bank rate was in order to do the investment. You know, General Motors, Ford Motor Company, everybody does that kind of thing. So capital investment is all about, it's about return on investment. In, in the military business, you know, we negotiate our profit with the customer. Uh, and so capital investment is done because we want to over, you know, we know, lower the cost of the product overall, we want to improve quality, save factory space, but it's not the direct return on investment kind of mentality that regular companies have. So I find that, uh, you know, we've, we've looked at a lot of composites uh, activities um, and, you know, one of the big, uh, entry requirements for composites is it's a very expensive business to enter into, uh, especially if you want to do automation, uh, but autoclaves, inspection equipment, uh, broad goods equipment, the, 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 the in initial buy-in for composites is very, is very high. And that, that's, that's a very limiting thing for small companies trying to keep up with technology and, uh, 
uh, it's certainly certainly one of the things maybe this driven some of the consolidation that we see in a lot of places um, there's also the question of i think in companies whether you do really want to make or buy i i'm a believer i'm a firm believer that it's very difficult to design what you don't know how to make. And so I'm a believer that you need to be able to fabricate, not, not all, but you need to be able to understand how you fabricate composite parts, what kind of tolerances you can get. Uh, you need to be able to fabricate it to be able to really know how to design with it. And so I'm a believer in that uh, design build thing. Again, I think composites will continue to be something uh, that a lot of companies go outside. Lockheed, Lockheed in general, buys most of our composite parts in industry, as opposed to in-house. So we're we're heavily sourced by. Uh, well, it's interesting. Uh, was Orbital ATK, but now that's Northrop Grumman, for example. It's just one example, but uh, those are. Uh, it is kind of an interesting twist when you're actually buying from your competitors on some of your major things. But again, that's the nature of the business. Okay. Yeah. And to follow on with that. So are the challenges more technology related or are they cultural related within the company or is it a mix? I think it's a mix. I think the data uh, issues are clearly cultural it, more so than anything. And because of the way we've grown up and uh, you know, people, people tend to like to want to manage the data in their systems. I, um, uh, <laughs> One of our vice presidents told me one time that the hardest part is going to be for people to let go of their data between production and sustainment and uh, in finance and whatever, all of those people, they, 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 they keep their data because that's the power is the data that they have. That's a tough cultural problem. Technology, on the other hand, um, I've, just, I've just continued to be amazed at the pace of technology innovation. I mean, uh, and I'm also a believer that, you know, you can't stand still, you've got to continue to research. We have an organization we call Manufacturing Technology at Lockheed, and that Manufacturing Technology's job is to, is to be there on the forefront, to look at the, at the opportunities on, on, in production, and they go out and find solutions to that. So uh, we have an organization, very active organization that's looking at automation, that's looking at, at new materials and new ways of doing things. And uh, that's really helped us. We've, we've certainly got a lot of benefit out of that on F-35. Again, uh, F-22 was a lot fewer airplanes, very difficult to do automation in a small program run. However, today's technology is, is trying to be more, more flexible so that I can use one automation, maybe robot to do multiple, multiple jobs and that, that kind of thing. So flexible automation, I think is one of the catchwords for the future. Okay, so I got one more specific question and then a general question to wrap this up. So the specific question is around, um, you know, we talk about digitization and uh, industry 4.0 about improving the efficiency, quality uh, of the products. Are you seeing any impact on safety worker safety with these technologies? Well, actually, uh, a lot of different things we're working on. In fact, uh, we had one of our divisions that was putting these uh, stress measuring devices on their employees to look at, you know, their, their lifting types of things during the day and where they were getting stressed. I mean, that's the kind of thing that's happening. Certainly manufacturing simulation can help a lot by looking at, you know, where people have to put things there. So I think the technology is helping all the way around uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, we want our workers to come to work and go home safe. Um, and, uh, and certainly there's things, because of the nature of the beast, there's things that they can do uh, that can get them hurt. You know, they can, you know, uh, you get on top of an airplane, you typically have a harness on, make sure you don't fall off the airplane or you got, you know, 360 degree coverage down there. So those are all things that it's easy, easier to do in the world of simulation to prepare uh, for having a safe product. Okay. So then the final general question to close this out, are there things that SAMPI and ACMA and uh, you know, other organizations, maybe even uh, government private public partnerships can be doing to help, uh, especially the small to medium sized businesses 
uh, be able to implement these technologies, learn best practices, and, and move forward with their uh, activities? Yeah, I think there are. And, and let's, let's say one of the things that I think is fundamental is uh, composite training. You know, how do, how do people uh, learn how to make composites? Not that straightforward. If, if you've ever uh, done uh, layup and bagging yourself, I'm sure you understand it's not that straightforward. And, you know, you got you got to really, especially when you're working with a new material system, uh, you may have to do dozens of different types of uh, uh, breather organizations and trying to make sure you have the right tooling and all that kind of stuff. So there's plenty, there's plenty to do with certainly, certainly with tutorials. Uh, I think, uh, you know, industry government collaboration with some of these small businesses is also very possible because, uh, you know, we've been involved with programs like uh, uh, small business innovation research types of programs. So there's a lot of things I think that can, that can come from that. But, but I think, again, one of the key things is just making sure that, uh, for example, when we were looking for composite locations at times, sometimes we struggle because we go, well, there's just not the, the, the staff there. There's just not the, the, the knowledgeable workers in that area to be able to do this, this project. So, you know, composites takes a long time having to bring people in that, Maybe we're working at McDonald's and trying to make them a composite people. It's just not cost effective. So we want to, we, we typically want areas where we have, we know that there is a concentration of uh, knowledgeable folks to be able to do that. Great. Well, thank you so much, Don. It's been a pleasure to hear your presentation and to have some dialogue with you and answer questions from the audience. Thanks to the audience for the excellent questions. Um, we want to thank all of those who participated in this event uh, today. If you have additional questions, uh, feel free to fill out the contact form on the CAMEX website and CAMEX will follow up. Uh, make sure to register for the uh, CAMEX 2020 virtual session to learn more about Composites 4.0 Factory of the Future Best Practices uh, panel session that will be held during CAMEX week. Um, you'll receive an email follow up uh, from this uh, presentation with a 10% discount for the CAMEX virtual event and uh, look forward to seeing you there. I also lead the Factory of the Future uh, technical working group within SAMPI. And so if you're interested in getting involved, please contact me and we'd love to have your involvement. Our main mission is to help put together uh, similar sessions like these for future SAMPI events. So again, thank you, Don. And uh, thank you to all the participants and thank you to CAMEX and uh, Sampi for helping to put this on. And uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Brianna. And thank you, Bob, appreciate it. Thank you, Don and Bob, that was an excellent session. So have a great day, guys, we'll talk soon.